Jean Schnepp here. Welcome to another Savvy Sightseer video vacation and the latest addition to the Local Parks series. For this one, we are venturing off Long Island to one of the area's most important and impressive parks, Central Park, considered by some to be a museum without walls, or even America's first theme park, with the theme being nature. In the 1800s, New York City's population was exploding from under 61,000 in 1800, it had mushroomed to more than 300,000 four decades later. That prompted New York Evening Post editor William Cully Bryant to issue a call to set aside land for a large public park before the entire area would be overdeveloped. Momentum grew until 1853 when a bill authorized the city to acquire a little less than 800 acres north of the city center. It was a rocky and swampy area, mostly uninhabited. Property in a five-acre section along the west side, known as Seneca Village, which was mainly black-owned re residences, was purchased or taken by eminent domain and cleared. In 1857, the newly formed Board of Commissioners of Central Park announced a design competition with a top prize of $2,000 for a plan to rehabilitate the expanse. Taking the honors and beating out 32 other entries was a two-man team, Frederick Olmsted, a Connecticut-born lover of European estate parks, and Calvert Vox, a British civil architect. They quickly set about creating what has been billed as one of the most important works of art in America. Reading their original proposal, which they dubbed Greensward for a 19th century term for broad open long concept, it is compelling. It's easy to forget that the Central Park of today was a marshy mess and that it is an entirely man-made and engineered creation. They put extensive thought into every aspect of development of a park that would be, quote, a beautiful open space in which quiet drives, rides, and strolls may be had. They envisioned lawns, gardens, lakes, ponds, waterfalls, and woodlands, all very deliberately designed to look as though entirely natural. Traffic was to be minimized by using bridges and tunnels. This would limit pedestrian crossings and any interruption of the idyllic scene. Many of these have since been closed to vehicles entirely. In the 1860s, more land was acquired and the park now encompasses 843 acres. More than 200 movies have been shot in there making it one of the most famous backdrops of cinema. The park has even been called the lungs of the city. Although I grew up a stone's throw from the city in Queens Village, like so many others, I never gave much thought to the park, other than how to cut through it from point A to B. Now, I invite you to join me as I make the park a destination in itself. I explore its wonders and gain a grand respect for the work and devotion of the two 19th century visionaries who persevered despite civil war on a national as well as local administrative level and delivered their dream for posterity to still relish in the 21st century. Bryant's concern over 170 years ago were clearly on target as this view of New York skyline from inside the park bears out. He had not, had he not led the charge to carve out a piece of the city and preserve it from glass and steel development, it is easy to see what could have happened. Comparing Olmsted and Vox's 1858 design entry and then an update they submitted in 1868, you can see they stayed pretty much true to their original vision. The landscape architects perceived the park project as two distinct sections, which they labeled simply upper and lower parks. They described the upper region roughly from the large reservoir north as having lines that were bold and sweeping, the highest ideal that can be aimed for in a park. They were intent to interfere with it as little as possible. The lower park they viewed as having a different character with a series of graceful undulations suggesting lawn or gardeness treatment and bold rocky bluffs that helped to give an individuality to it, they said. While the general footprint has remained largely the same, Many notable features have changed and been added over the years. For example, the area east of the old reservoir was originally designated first as a playground and later as an undeveloped ground, 
Today, it is indeed a play area of sorts, just not the kind with children's slides, but rather it is one of those for people who enjoy wandering through noted art pieces. It's the Metropolitan Museum of Art, by area, one of the world's largest art galleries. Although the park can be accessed at several points, the designers thought the finest approach from the city is certain to be along the Fifth Avenue. It has great advantages for the purpose of a dignified entrance to the park, they said. Today, the entrance considered by most to be the main one is at its southeast corner, called the Grand Army Plaza. We'll see just how distinct the park's different personalities are as we focus on much the same reg region as the planners did, on the lower park, south of the Croton Reservoir, which covers about 40% of the upper park. It was renamed the Jacqueline Kennedy Onassis Reservoir after it was decommissioned in 1993. One thing that hasn't changed much is the arsenal, one of the oldest structures on the land. Olmsted and Box were not at all happy with it. In the 1850s, the castle-style fortress was opened as a munitions depot for the State National Guard. Its location had been considered optimum at the time for deploying troops to the city and its shorelines. In 1857, the city bought the arsenal for $275,000 and repurposed it for a more benign use as part of the new city park. Although the designer duo considered it a very unattractive structure and only tolerably built, they figured it could be useful, perhaps as a museum. They spruced up the exterior and basically disguised it by planting trees. It served a number of purposes over the years, as a police precinct, a weather observatory, the initial home of the American Museum of Natural History, and even a makeshift menagerie. In the 1870s, museum exhibits were moved to their new headquarters on Central Park West, and the exotic and domestic animals that had been do donated over the years were moved to the newly built zoo. Robert Moses, chairman of the New York State Council of Parks for four decades, starting in 1924, was referred to as a master builder. It was he who revamped the ar arsenal in 1934, making it the parks department headquarters. When the odd collection of animals had outstayed their welcome at the arsenal, they were initially moved to a group of five wooden buildings nearby known as a menagerie. These were replaced with brick and concrete buildings in 1934 and revamped again in the late 1980s. The zoo or wildlife center covers about six and a half acres and has an eclectic collection of 1,500 animals living in naturalistic environments. Among the 120 species are some of my favorites, penguins. In addition to the living animals, visitors really enjoy the antics of a mechanical menagerie each day at 8 a.m. and again every 30 minutes until 6 p.m., a band of animals, including bear, elephant, kangaroo, and penguin, comes to life to play a repertoire of children's songs and seasonal tunes at the Delacorte clock. It was named after a philanthropist who loved Europe's medieval mechanical clocks, and so he donated funds to have a similar one in New York City. Part of Robert Moses' plan for the park in post-war America was to add fun and fantastical touches to the more serious aspects of the park, leading the way for additions, such as the Delacorte clock at the zoo entrance. Such man-made works of art were not intended to be a highlight of the park, though. Olmsted had called them incidents that took away from his vision, but today there are nearly 75 such sculptures, elaborately designed gateways, and other works of art within the park. Delacorte also funded the whimsical Alice in Wonderland sculpture, which joined the park's landscape in 1959. He had commissioned it as a gift to the children of New York City, but also as a tribute to his late wife, Margarita, who often read Lewis Carroll's Alice's Adventures in Wonderland to their children. The Spanish-born American sculptor, Jose de Crep, added a tribute to the philanthropist by using his likeness as the face of the Mad Hatter. De Crep also saluted his own daughter, Donna by using her image for Alice's face. The 12,000 pound statue is a popular climbing spot for Little Park visitors who have worn parts of the sculpture to a fine sheen. Also from childhood fantasy and another popular spot for climbing kids, just a few steps from Alice is the Hans Christian Andersen statue. The author who penned 
some 150 fairy tales and stories, has had a place of honor near the model boat pond since 1956. There's some serious sculptures too. The Women's Rights Pioneers Monument is the first to honor real women in Central Park, and it is one of the more recent additions. It was unveiled in August 2020, commemorating the centennial anniversary of the ratification of the Women's Right to Vote Amendment. The bronze statue depicts three pivotal women's rights advocates. Susan B. Anthony, a social reformer who played a major role in the women's suffragette movement, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, an abolitionist and one of the first leaders of the women's rights movement, and Sojourner Truth, an abolitionist who had been born into slavery and was later recognized by Smithsonian Magazine as one of the 100 most significant Americans of all time. The monument became an impromptu memorial site with tributes attached to the fencing in front of it when Supreme Court Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg, who advocated for women's rights, passed away in October 2020. At the southeast section of the park, we find one sculpture that combines both the serious and nostalgic in the form of Balto, a four and a half foot wide memorial to a heroic dog who saved a city. His bronze coat glows from the pats of countless children and adults. In January 1925, a diphtheria epidemic struck Nome, Alaska, at the same time a blizzard grounded planes carrying a life-saving serum. Against all odds, 20 sled dog teams with more than 200 dogs and their handlers made the six-day, 674-mile trek. But it was the last musher, Gunnar Kaysen, and his intrepid dog, Balto, who are best remembered for their final push into the city. Gunnar hailed Balto as the real hero for finding his way through the blizzard when his master could not. Balto also found his way to his own memorial dedication ceremony in the park in 1925, just 10 months after his storied mush. At its inception, the southern portion of Central Park, the first area that would be reached by families traveling from the heart of the city, was considered by designers Olmsted and Box as the children's district. It is here where a Victorian Gothic style building, one of the park's most picturesque structures, was built. Its purpose, though, was far from fun-loving. At the time the dairy was constructed in 1870, there was a public health crisis in the city, known as the Swill Milk Scandal. Malnourished cows of the 1850s and 60s produced poor milk, which was often further adulterated and sold, resulting in an estimated 8,000 dead children a year. The dairy was developed as a source of fresh milk for children. Eventually, the milk industry came under legislative regulation and the dairy's mission changed. It became a restaurant for a while, then a storage facility, and in 1979, it was repurposed as Central Park's first visitor center. Although the area had been officially designated as a children's section, no formal playgrounds as we know them today were built in the park until the early 1900s. The earliest playgrounds that started appearing in public places in the 1880s were called sand gardens and featured little more than sand boxes. Designers Olmsted and Vox, in keeping with their vision of a place for relaxation and enjoying nature, had merely designated a hill in the southern portion for children to climb on. But as the park's popularity zoomed, especially for children and families, the children's district was reconsidered and redeveloped with equipment a comfort station, and a large wading pool, one of the first in the city. This is the park's oldest playground, Heckscher, built in 1926. It is also the largest, covering between two and three acres, and was named after its benefactor, multimillionaire philanthropist Albert Heckscher, who financed several parks, including one named for him in Islip on Long Island's South Shore, and one in Huntington that also houses a museum of art in his name. Today, there are 21 playgrounds located throughout Central Park, each with its own unique theme, design, and type of play structures and equipment. There's 26 clay and four hard tennis courts, as well as 26 baseball or softball fields. Volleyball players can choose among four beach sand courts and four asphalt ones. And hoopsters haven't been left out. There's courts in several locations. Adding to the allure of the area for children is the carousel, the merry-go-round was not universally welcomed by park administration when it debuted in 1871. 
but once they realized it would be popular among paying visitors, the prospect of ride-generated revenue led it to become a permanent part of the park. The original was powered by a mule and horse who walked in a hidden compartment below the attraction and were signaled by the operator to start and stop on cue. There have been several replacements over the years. The current one was found abandoned in an old trolley terminal in Brooklyn's Coney Island in, in 1951. Originally crafted in 1908, it is one of the nation's largest merry-go-rounds, featuring 57 hand-carved horses and two decorative chariots. Regular repair and maintenance keep the more than a century-old amusement running, much to the joy of an estimated 250,000 riders each year. For kids who want to run and play instead, there is Sheep Meadow. Like all the landscapes in Central Park, this beautiful 15-acre expanse of Sheep Meadow is man-made. Its smooth green lawn bears no resemblance to its original rocky and swampy look. The designers reshaped it by blasting away rocks and adding two feet of new surface soil. It is reported that more gunpowder was used in the overall development of the park than was spent in the entire Battle of Gettysburg, and Sheep Meadow was the most costly construction undertaken in the park. It became home to a flock of sheep, which Olmsted and Box believed enhanced the romantic English quality that visitors were supposed to enjoy, viewing from the paths but not walking on. In 1871, Jacob Ray Mould, a British architect who made significant contributions to the park, designed an elaborate sheep pen to house both the flock and its shepherd. In 1934, the sheep were transferred to Prospect Park in Brooklyn, and the sheep fold was converted into Tavern on the Green, a restaurant. The lawn was open to the masses for various events and activities, including watching as the first landing on the moon was televised there in 1969. Not far from the meadow is a section that became devoted to authors and is the most stylized area. At the Literary Walk, you will find statues of such well-known writers as Sir Walter Scott and Robert Burns, and most notably, William Shakespeare. In 1864, to commemorate the 300th anniversary of the great playwright's birth, a prominent group of New York actors raised funds for the sculpture by holding benefit performances of Shakespeare's plays. Edwin Booth, perhaps the most famous Shakespearean actor of the day, advised the artist, American John Ward, about proper Elizabethan clothing for the bard's likeness. Booth's brother, John Wilkes, also an actor, had a different claim to fame. A notable oddity about Shakespeare's monument is the lack of any identification at the base of the great author, unless you walk around behind him. Park administration wanted to make sure that the deceased playwright wouldn't offend the likeness of a deceased explorer installed 30 years later across the flower bed from him. Christopher Columbus's statue was planted facing Shakespeare, so it was determined the British author should be turned to likewise face him and not have his back to the explorer. Moving the base proved too expensive, so only the statue was turned, leaving his inscription behind him. And so the two face each other and stand at the start of a controversial piece of the park, the mall. In 1853, then Commissioner Robert Dillon tried to amend Box and Olmsted's design by adding a European-style Grand Long Concourse, or Cathedral Avenue, running straight from 59th Street all the way to 106th, using suspension bridge bridges to cross the reservoirs and the ravine, that's the park's largest woodland area in the upper section. But the designers were adamant there would be no such long straight drive. Among other concerns was their fear that it would turn into a racetrack for the horsey set. They did agree a magnificent city park should contain a grand promenade, level, spacious, and thoroughly shaded, but one substantially shorter than Dillon's vision. And so the mall, lined with American elm trees, runs from 66th to 72nd Street. Once referred to as an open-air hall of reception by its creators, the mall was specifically designed to accommodate the width of carriages passing along it. In the mid-1800s, these carriages would drop off their wealthy inhabitants at the mall's starting point, where they could enjoy the natural scene scenery and mingle with people of uh, lesser status. By the time these high society visitors strolled their way to the Bethesda Terrace at the end of the mall, their carriages were waiting 
to bring them to their next destination. Bethesda Terrace Arcade is the arched interior walkway that links the mall to Bethesda Fountain and the Central Park Lake just beyond. It is hard to imagine the level of deterioration and disrepair this stunning arcade was in just a few years ago. But with a $7 million infusion from the Central Park Conservancy, the gateway was restored in 2007. The main focus of restoration was reinstalling its British Minton tile ceiling. Most of the nearly 16,000 tiles, which come together to form 49 panels, creating an elaborate geometric pattern, had been in storage for more than 20 years. The arcade was one of Mould's handiworks, created in the 1860s. Typically, this type of tile is used as flooring in great cathedrals, but Mould elevated the colorful patterned ceramics to the ceiling, the only place in the world where these special inlaid tiles were installed as such. While eye-catching, they are weighty, a total of some 50 tons, over which carriages once passed on the road above, leading to the ceiling's weakening and corrosion. Fortunately, administrators had the foresight in 1983 to take the tiles down and store them until enough funding could be raised to properly restore them to their place of honor. The arcade is the ground level of this architectural jewel at the end of the mall. A walk on its two-level staircase gives visitors very different rewards, a breathtaking view from the top of its terrace and some amazing sculpture work along the balustrades. It's worth taking time to really appreciate the artistry of these carvings, which have a central theme of the passage of time. On top of the terrace and the middle picture in this screen, there's a rooster crowing as morning breaks. Opposite it is the owl ringing in the night. Carved into the stair walls is the eternal passing of the seasons, represented by the flowers, birds, etc., that you would see during different times of the year. The centerpiece of this area is the Bethesda Fountain, topped by the Angel of the Waters. Vox and Olmsted intended it to be the only sculpted piece in the park. New York City native Emma Stebbing was tasked with creating the focal point piece, a singular honor for female sculptors in the 1860s. The fountain and area are named for Bethesda, a biblical reference to a pool believed to have healing powers. Below the angel are four cherub-like figures who represent temperance, purity, health, and peace. Fans of the NBC series Manifest will recognize the angel of the waters as a pivotal part of the plot in 2018, the show's first season. The angel shakes loose her fountain mooring and flies off to warn a key character to save another in the Supernatural Mystery series. Mould's artistry can be seen throughout the park and his partnership with Vox resulted in many beautiful staples of park viewing. On the top left of the screen is one of my favorite archways. Built by the duo in 1862, the stone bridge is named after the gray wax stone sandstone quarried in the Hudson River Valley that was used in its construction. On the top right at 68, 62nd Street, offering one of the best views of the skyline while giving the sense of a countryside glen, is a graceful structure known as the Gapstow Bridge. This one, made of stone in 1896, replaced Mould's 1874 wooden bridge, which couldn't stand the rigors of time. Across the bottom is another Vox and Mould construction, but one that fared much better, the Bow Bridge. Made of cast iron, not wood, it is the oldest such bridge in Central Park and the second oldest cast iron bridge in the entire United States. It's one of the park's most iconic and photographed features. Built in 1862, it spans 60 feet across Central Park Lake and was the result of a compromise between Commissioner Dillon and Olmsted and Vox, who didn't want a bridge there at all. Rather, they'd envisioned visitors wandering leisurely around the lake beyond the Bethesda Terrace to the Ramble, that's a 36-acre expanse designed to look like the forests of upstate New York, with winding paths and trails through dense plantings. Boxamol decided on a low-profile, delicately curved bridge shaped like an archer's bow, hence its name. It is today an integral part of the park and considered one of the most romantic locations, overlooking rowboats quietly gliding along the lake. It's popular for marriage proposals, both in real life and in moviedom. 
Named for the Italian word meaning beautiful view, Central Park's Belvedere Castle offers visitors exactly what its name implies, a bird's eye look over some of the park's picturesque ponds, woods, lawns, and, of course, skyline. Originally designed in 1865 by Dream Team Vox and Mold, Belvedere Castle was intended to be a Victorian folly. That's a fantasy structure which was only good for its grand facade and views, nothing else. It did gain actual purpose over time though and for a while was a weather center. Today it houses a visitors complex and observatory, an educational site where visitors can learn about nature and wildlife in Central Park. One of the spectacular sights from its balcony is across Turtle Pond, home to five species of turtles year-round. And the view continues on to the Great Lawn and New York City skyline beyond. In the precise geographical center of Central Park is a green pasture of 55 acres that is considered one of the most famous lawns in the world. Looking at the expanse, you might be surprised to hear it was quite an eyesore to Vox and Olmsted. The city's original source of drinking water was stored in a huge rectangular section known as the first Croton Reservoir, constructed in 1842, well before there was any thought of a park in the same place. The reservoir became obsolete in 1917 and all of its water was drained. It was filled in with excavations from the construction of a subway line and Rockefeller Center until 1937 when grass was planted, creating the oval styled field now known as the Great Lawn. Maintained by the Central Park Conservancy, the Great Lawn is host for a vast array of recreational activities, from summertime picnics and people watching to concerts. Nearby, and acquired a section of the park, is the Swedish Cottage, now a marionette theater. It is the only building in Central Park that was not actually created for the park. A sign at the main entrance describes the building's journey from Sweden in 1876, when it arrived in the U.S. for the Philadelphia Centennial Exhibition, the first World's Fair in the country. It demonstrated traditional Swedish schoolhouse architecture and wood craftsmanship. The cottage caught the eye of Olmsted, so when the exhibit ended, it journeyed to its current location, serving for a time as a tool house. It was also used as a public restroom until some Swedes reportedly objected. Then it was a lab for studying insects, and during World War II, it was a headquarters for the civil defense. In 1947, it became a workspace for a troupe of traveling puppeteers who performed throughout the city. In 1973, a permanent stage was installed in the cottage for in-house productions. Famed puppeteer Sherry Lewis is said to have trained with the cottage's puppeteering staff. The cottage stands across from Shakespeare's garden, a perfect place for a relaxing afternoon. It took on the Bard's name in 1916 to mark the 300th anniversary of his death. Its quaint paths wind their way around four acres of plants and flowers that are mentioned in works by the playwright, as well as some that grew in his own garden in Stratford-upon-Avon, England. With its serene and romantic atmosphere, the English cottage garden is a popular spot for small weddings. Lovers of William Shakespeare's plays can enjoy open-air performances at the adjacent Delacorte Theatre, which opened in 1962 with The Merchant of Venice, starring George C. Scott and James Earl Jones. Another British connection is over on the east side of the park, the Obelisk, also known as Cleopatra's Needle. It was installed near the Metropolitan Museum of Art in 1881, making it the oldest outdoor monument in New York City and the oldest man-made object in Central Park. A gift from Egypt in commemoration of the opening of the Suez Canal and to cultivate trade arrangements between the countries, the obelisk is half of a pair of 70-foot tall, more than 200-ton granite pillars. Its twin rises along the River Thames in London, England. They were each carved from single pieces of stone granite an estimated 3,500 years ago as a gift for the pharaoh of the time on his 30th anniversary of leadership. Later, Roman Emperor Caesar, Caesar Augustus moved the pillars to Alexandria, where they stood by a temple Cleopatra had built to honor Julius Caesar. Centuries later, they journeyed to the UK and US. An optimum site in New York City for the monument was debated, 
but ultimately inside the park between the Great Lawn and the Met won out, in large part because being in the park meant it could never be boxed in and overshadowed by the skyscrapers starting to dot New York City streets. American philanthropist William Vanderbilt had underwritten the obelisk's expensive, nearly year-long journey from Egypt. In 2011, a cleaning project was undertaken after an Egyptian minister of antiquities threatened to repossess the monument, which had fallen into neglect, and take it back to his country. The needle's over 2,000 square foot surface was then cleaned of decades of dirt and pollution to reveal hieroglyphs singing the ancient pharaoh's praises. One of the park's play areas that has a truly different personality is the ancient playground, just north of the obelisk in the Met. It's not actually all that old, though. Replacing a playground demolished to build a new wing on the Met, this one was created in 1973, but designed to evoke a sense of an ancient city. It features antiquities in keeping with its neighbors. There are pyramids, an obelisk, and a sundial, inspired by the Needle and the Met's Egyptian collection. Entry to the playground is through one of the park's beautiful and intricate gates. These ones, called the Osborne Gates, were named for William Church Osborne, a philanthropist and one-time president of the Met as well as the Children's Aid Society. The ornate entryway depicts five of Aesop's fables, with groups of small animals featured in the popular children's stories. When they were installed at the original playground in 1953, the Municipal Art Society identified them as some of the most important pieces in Central Park. No trip to Central Park would be complete without a stop at a memorial to Beatles legend and peace activist John Lennon. The centerpiece in this designated quiet zone, known as Strawberry Fields, is a simple mosaic highlighting the word imagine, the musician's sing signature song of peace. The artwork was made by Italian craftsmen and are a gift from the city of Naples. All around the memorial, dedicated in 1985, is a living tribute, a thought conceived by his wife Yoko Ono and brought to reality by landscape architect Bruce Kelly, who specialized in Olmsted style environments. Ono, considered a conceptual artist, donated a million dollars to fund renovations in what had been a favorite spot for her and John, just steps from their home in the landmark Dakota apartment building in front of which he was shot and killed in 1980. Ono invited countries from around the world to contribute plants to create an international garden. The two and a half acre, teardrop shaped lot was transformed from a rundown patch to a lush environment with about 150 trees, 5,000 shrubs, and 20,000 perennials. Among gifts were British oaks, Monaco dogwoods, Dutch tulips, Russian river birches, and Canadian maples. Unfortunately, birds ate all the strawberry plants Mr. Kelly had planted. The so-called Garden of Peace is championed by 121 countries whose names appear on a bronze plaque at the memorial, a testament to the star's international appeal. Which brings us full circle, back to the original intent of the park's designers to offer city dwellers and visitors a place of reflection and refuge. I like to end all of my programs with the words of Dr. Seuss. Sometimes you don't appreciate the moment until it becomes a memory. And I like to add to it, always remember to celebrate the moments and treasure the memories. I hope you've enjoyed our journey around Central Park. If you have any questions about the program, email me or use the contact page on my website. Of course, I also invite you to visit my website to see any of my European destinations. You can check my Programs tab to see what Savvy Sightseer presentations are being offered by your library or community center. Till next time, another reminder, with a place as diverse and beautiful as Central Park nearby, it's always good to remember to stop and smell the roses.